This is Joe, Michelle, Melissa, and Shannon with More Than a Sniff, where we talk about everything dog, from training to nutrition, from behavior modification to grooming, from vet visits to dog parks, from getting to know us to having guests. Today we're going to talk about... Hello? Bill, it's Shannon at Western State Canine College. How are you? Good. I am super excited to have you on our podcast. We're just trying to get it to connect to our speaker. Oh, that would be great. Okay, I think we got it. All right. Perfect. Yay! Thank you for being available for us. No problem. Yeah, so Bill, this is Joe. And uh, uh, and uh, Shannon and I, we may have one of our trainers pop in. I think she's running behind because of the snow. Um, okay. But we're going to get going. We are super excited. Um and we've been doing a series on dogs with jobs and, um, you know, their career and, you know, just getting an insight on what it's like to be um, on your end of it and working with the animals that you work with in mm-hmm. what you do. So we're just going to go through and ask some questions and talk about what you do and, and the jobs of, of the animals that you work with. Okay. Do you, oh. do you need short answers? Uh, no, I mean, we can just talk. So we don't need, okay. we're not worried about that part of it. We like okay, to so make we're not this, looking for sound bites. No, we are very, very, uh, just kind of raw. You know, we just have a conversation yep. about it and, and, uh, talk through everything. So we're not, we're not pressed right. for time or anything like that. Good. So tell us a little bit about you and your job. First of all, um, I call myself a theatrical animal trainer um, because I began my career training the very first dog for the original production of Annie, the musical back on Broadway in 1977. I love it. Um, And since then uh, I made a career out of training uh, the majority of animals for Broadway shows for the last four decades and um, all of them being rescue dogs or cats. Yeah. So what, um, what are the, the types of animals that you're looking for? Do you have, uh, you know, kind of a, a pool to draw from or are, do you own them? Um, that's a, uh, that's a good question because currently my wife and I own 31, uh, performing canine. I love it. Um, that's awesome. Five of them are retired. Um, I would say, 15 of them are unemployed and the other <laughs> 10 are like in training. Okay. Um, but uh, they're all um, handpicked to be uh, animals who perform in entertainment, specifically theater. Okay. Um, and the, what happens is uh, some writer comes up with an idea for a show or movie or something uh, with a spe- specific breed in mind, and then they'll call trainers, you know, to train them. So uh-huh. all the dogs that we have are actually uh, as a result of some script that came our way um, and was either unsuccessful, in in which case we still give the dogs a forever home, or sure. highly successful. So the dogs who do Annie will do it year after year after year in different productions around the country, or Wizard of Oz, or Legally Blonde, the musical. So um, so everybody's working all the time. Okay. Okay. So you kind of, you market out there, um, the dogs in a sense, so that all over the country has access to those dogs that you have trained for those. They, they do. Okay. They do. But, you know, uh, theater is not Wall Street. Right. And so, you know, a small theater in Salt Lake City, Utah, may not be able to afford the expense of getting us out there sure. putting a trainer and a person up for four weeks, sure. you know, and, yep. and paying a fee that, um, that we can live off of. And, you know, so like a lot of community theaters obviously can't afford our services, right? but there are many large theaters all around the country, all around the world who do call us to provide animals for their shows. That's awesome. Um, so tell us a little bit about with, with the dogs, what your, um, what you're looking for, just general characteristics that you look for um, from, you know, as you're out looking at rescues and, and what, what characteristics are you looking for? Well, you know, as any dog trainer can tell you, there are 
Mm. All dogs have a certain amount of intelligence. And then every once in a while you find what I call a super dog. Um, a dog who, when you meet it, um, you know, has great drive, great patience, great intelligence, great kindness. Um, and, you know, whether that dog is a dog working with, you know, um, people with disabilities or whether that dog is working, you know, as a protection dog with the New York City Police Department, we need the same type of dog, you know, to be in entertainment. Um, so, you know, when we when we go to shelters and it's it's not that hard, I you know, I share my secret with everybody. Uh -huh. um, when I go to a shelter, um, there are three types of dogs. There's the dogs who are cringing in the back. There are the dogs who are barking at the front of the cage, you know, making a lot of noise to get out. Right. And then they're the ones who just sort of hang in there. Yep. And those are the ones right there, the ones who are hanging there that I go to. And people will say, well, why? And, you know, the, the dogs who are cowering obviously can't deal with the stress of that situation. And yep. they're just closed down. Right. Uh, and, and the ones who are barking to get out and are, you know, reactive or can't deal with the stress either. And they're reacting badly. Right. But the ones who are just sort of taking in all this bad stuff and dealing with it right there, that says to me, okay, this dog has some patience, sure. you know, and then, then I'll do a temperament test, you know, to find out if there's any abuse or aggression triggers, because whether you're on set or you're backstage or you're coming out of stage door, you know, you meet multitudes of people, who may act inappropriately around a dog. And, you know, you have to have a dog who won't turn and defend itself. You right. Know, be very patient. Yeah. You know, and third, a dog who has a willingness to want to please humans, you know, yeah. because, um, you know, I what I've just described could be a nice bloodhound. Sure. But bloodhounds <laughs> have no desire to please humans. They just <laughs> right. want to blow their nose. Yeah. So we yeah. need a dog who, you know, will look you in the eye and, and, take some treats and, you know, want to interact with humans, you know, and if you can find, and those dogs are in the shelter, yeah. I've been adopting them for decades. You know, right. I say to people, if you don't have a lot of good dog experience, use those three things, you know, to adopt a really, you know, medium of the road dog that you can live with. Right. Yep. Yeah. They, those are the ones that tend to get overlooked actually most of the mm -hmm. time because the, yep. of the emotion Yep. as they go through. So, Give us just give us a a description of the the day in the life with you and your and your training and and what you're prepping the dogs for and um, you know obviously you you've got to continue to work with them even though you may not have you know a production going on but you still are prepping and and working and getting the dogs ready for um, that career. Well, and and you've just described one of the big fallacies about what I do and the way that I train. Um, people for some reason think that, you know, we do that. We put the dogs through their paces, they're ready to go. Um, when actually it's the complete opposite. Um, you know, I say to people all the time, I don't train tricks. Yep. I don't train behaviors. I train dogs to want to work with man. You know? Yeah. If you could teach a dog to listen and listen in a positive way, then it's very easy to teach it behaviors. Right. So how do you get a dog to be interested in pleasing humans, right? Yep. First, you have to show them that we're kind, that we communicate their language with them, and that it's fun to learn, you know. Once we've done that, once we've taken a dog and sort of shown them that it's fun to be with us, I, I think it would just be kind of crazy to put them through their paces every day when – as trainers, 24 hours a day, we're doing that with every interaction. Yeah. You know, what I say to pet owners is you have to be 100% consistent, yep. you know, when you give a command and you follow through, right? Yep. Now, it doesn't matter whether you do that one time a day or you do that, you know, 50 times a day in a, in a, a training exercise, as long as you're consistent. So, you know, my wife and, and I and my daughter and my staff, every time we ask a dog to do something around the house, we follow through with it. And so we maintain that good relationship, but the rest of the time, they're just dogs. Yep. You know, our home is specially designed where, you know, we don't have any runs. We don't have any kennels. We have wings of large rooms off of our main living area where they they live in packs. You know, uh -huh. they, you open a door and they go out five times a day and run around in the yard and chase squirrels and dig holes. 
and our dogs. So right. they feel the fresh air. They have companionship. They have human companionship. They get their needs met. And then when we have a project is when we sort of put them back into the, okay, well, these are the things you have to learn for this next job. So what we try to maintain is more of a holistic lifestyle for a dog, not putting so much pressure on it every day of its life, but keeping life easy, keeping life fun. And, oh, yeah, you know what? We're going to go to a theater and get some cookies. Come on, let's go. Right. So it's it's actually the opposite. We, we, we do more um, enrichment and make sure they have fun while they're here than we do training, you know, until we get the, until the job is lined up. Then they sort of go into a once a day training session, you know, in our training room. Um, And then that's sort of it. I think that's one of the hardest things that we, we teach really organic as well. And, and people like, how do you get your dog to do that? I, and, you know, for me, sometimes like, I, I don't know, they just do it. <laughs> you know, if, if I tell them to go lay down, they just go lay down. It's not a behavior that I've ever taught them. It's just very organic with us as well. Um, we're not, uh, it's, it's a hard thing. It's a hard concept to teach people that you don't train in a warehouse and then expect the dog to, uh, transfer all that into the home if there's nothing else behind it. So, um, exactly. That's, that's one, it's wonderful to hear. Um, it's definitely a very different approach to, you know, what we generally hear and the people that we have, have interviewed as well. Um, and that's, that's really how we do it here in overall training is, um, you know, you, we, we live with them. Um, and it's, Mm -hmm. They, they, we have jobs for our dogs, um, and they, they go to work, but it's, it's definitely very organic. So that's, that's fabulous to hear. Um, well, and I'm going to bring you back to how I got to that point. Yeah. Um, uh, I was a 19 years old and working in a theater here in Connecticut, uh, that as an apprentice, I was building scenery cause I wanted to be an actor. So I was just backstage and it was the first theater that did Annie. They needed a dog trainer. They couldn't afford a dog trainer from New York. Nobody on the paid staff threatened to do it or wanted to do it, you know, and they all threatened to quit. And so they needed a sucker. And being young and naive, they called me in the office, and they offered me a part in one of the shows if I would find and train a dog for no money. Now, I took that on because I wanted to be an actor, and I went to the shelter, and I, and I found the original Sandy uh, the day before it was going to be euthanized. But... I'm an only child who grew up on a farm here in Connecticut, uh-huh. and my, my only companions growing up were my dog, my cat, and my rabbit. And I, and I don't remember having a, a lonely childhood because I, I must have found ways to make them want to play with me and sure. be around me. Yeah. So it's sort of other-centered. It was like, how do you do things, and how do you play, and what are your games? So when, when I got the assignment you know, to do Sandy, it was like, well, you can't push a dog on stage. You can't force it to go on stage how do we make it so that it always wants to do what we want you make it fun you make it not frightening you make it you know pleasing so i sandy was the first animal actor to play a character in a live theatrical event prior to annie all the shows that were written have animal parts that you can remove and you know you can do gypsy the musical without the dogs you can do oliver the musical without the dogs but nobody told us that you can't turn a dog into an actor, that it can't do the same thing eight times a week. So that's what we did. And so I became known as the guy who could train animal actors, you know, to mm-hmm. go on stage in front of 2,000 people and do the same thing every night. Right. And how do you do that? You make it fun. You know, you know, you want, you want to get me to do something every day, make it fun for me and I'm there. <laughs> right. You know, yeah. that yeah. it's as simple as that. And, yeah. you know, so... It, it, it's, it's that organic, you know, uh, but so when we get a dog, a brand new dog, you know, usually they have a lot of problems. There's something, and we have to first teach them that we're kind. It's going to be fun. You've got to listen now. And once they, once that clicks in, you know, that's step number one. Then we start teaching them behaviors, you know, and like you said, <clears throat> they learn how to do the whole show in our training room, but that doesn't mean that they're going to walk onto a stage and do it. So then we start desensitizing them. We take them to a local high school theater. We take them to existing shows we have, and we start desensitizing them to all those other elements, you know, and then ask them to do those behaviors in these new elements that will resemble where they're ultimately going to perform. Right. And then at some point when they're ready, they get to make their debut, you know? Um, So it's, that's how we do it. Like you said, you know, you, 
I say the same thing. It's like just because you teach your dog to sit in your living room doesn't mean you've taught it to teach everywhere to sit everywhere. In right. The world. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So it's it's foreign to them. It's a, so it's it's great to hear that somebody else actually does that because <laughs> we get our dogs well, to do a lot without doing a lot. And of course, them. my work. Where does my work happen? In front of thousands of people, night after night. Right. So you can't. <laughs> if I fail. A lot of people see it. Yeah. You know. Yeah, exactly. So it, it became really about how do we make the dog always want to do it? Yeah. You know? Now, we know they always chase rabbits. We know they do repetitive behaviors. How do we make listening to humans one of those things they enjoy doing? Right. That that becomes how I train. And I hate to even use the word train. It's yeah. like how do we cooperate? How right. do we work together? Yeah. You know, because training almost implies some sort of domination. Yes. And Yep. In my field, it's cooperation. Right. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And even in ours, I, we don't, we don't, uh, it's really about existing together and living together uh, mm-hmm. with them. Shannon, what questions do you have? I, I want to know what do you find most challenging about this job? Um, uh, the most challenging part of, of my job unfortunately, is that, you know, as a trainer, like if you're competing with your dog and you've got that great connection, everything goes well. In my job, my dogs have to listen to a third party. You know, they have to, because you can't have a dog come on stage and look into the wing and get a command and then do it. You need them to focus on the actors. Right. So way back in Annie, you know, fortunately, I had a 11 year old girl that I had to turn into a trainer and she thought it was fun, you know? Right. Because um, it's play. It's fun. It's get to hang out with the dog. And so my first job was successful because my first actress loved playing with dogs. The biggest challenge now is how you get big stars and adult actors to get down on the floor and play with the dog. Right. And create that bond, as temporary as it may be, you know, to facilitate the training. Yeah. And so our dogs have to learn to not only give it up to us, but to give it up to perfect strangers who treat them nicely. Yeah. And and if somebody's willing to do that, that's great. But I'm telling you, 10% of the actors I work with either are allergic to dogs uh. <laughs> or they don't like dogs. And, and, and yet the producers expect me to have the dog listen to that person. So right. th- that's the most challenging part, you know, as much as I could say, don't cast a person who's allergic. Don't cast <laughs> sure. people who've never had dogs. Yeah. Ultimately, they don't listen. And, you know, that proves to be a problem. And what happens is that our our performance is diminished. You know, mm-hmm. and I can scientifically point that out to a producer after the fact that, you know, it's just like riding a horse. Yeah. You know, you can't, you know, we, we have horses we bring to set and we'll say that we need experienced riders because a horse will know if you've never ridden before. And, you know, it'll be a dangerous situation. So that's the biggest challenge. Um, working with the actors. So in follow-up to that, how much rehearsal time do you get with the actors? Where do you come in with your dog during the rehearsal process before the show opens? Um, Oftentimes on a new musical or a new play, I'm in on the writing stage. You know, uh, initially I wasn't known enough to be that collaborative, but in the last 20 years, people have realized that, you know, I will show up to the first day of rehearsal and go, oh, you can't do that. And they'll go, what do you mean you can't do that? that." So now they call me a year ahead of time and say, Bill, you know, we have the script and we, you know, and so I tell them what behaviors are actually doable on stage. So my participation starts way in the beginning before we ever get into rehearsal because writers, you know, are writing from their collective memory of what they think animals can do, which they've seen in movies and movies are much different than plays. So, you know, but for a Broadway show, a, a, a large production, we usually need eight weeks of rehearsal, okay. you know. Yeah. Um, for shows that the dogs already know, like say they're doing a production of Annie in Salt Lake, uh, I will call the director and say, you have to do the moves that the dog knows, and we will, I will teach the actors how to do that. And that will usually take two to four weeks. But training a dog from scratch, you know, we start a year ahead of time and then eight weeks with a rehearsal before the first live performance. Wow. 
just a little insight. Shannon um, does costume design for mm-hmm. our local places, so she's got a little insight into how things roll a little bit. And uh, you, we were literally just talking about that as far as how much time you get and and what yep. happens as far as that goes. Do you um, do you find that you have a solid crew of dogs that you can pull from? Or are you still constantly out looking and searching? Um, for new new dogs um no no with 31 we're like okay enough dogs yeah um but you know like for example it's sort of a supply and demand thing uh-huh uh we have four dogs that play sandy okay. you know and one who's retired now um because there are a lot of productions of annie right we have four dogs that play the wizard of oz you know that play toto uh-huh um we have um one set of bloodhounds that are used in a musical called A Christmas Story based on the movie. Uh-huh. Um, they play the Bumpus Hounds. We yeah. have the original ones who are now retired and 10 years old and the new ones. Okay. So um, the, once, we, you know, once we've trained a dog to learn a role, they will do it until the point at which they turn in. They look at me and go, I don't want to do this anymore. Sure. And then they, and then they retire. Okay. So if you've made the right choice in the beginning – the, the dogs will work until they're arthritic and then you have to forcibly retire them. Right. Um, so, but we do have attrition. I mean, any, in any given year, we might lose two or three dogs from old age at yep. which point we will replace them with younger versions of that character. Yeah. Um, uh, currently we have, uh, we're working on a brand new musical that's hopefully going to open on Broadway next year based on the book because of Win Dixie. Uh-huh. It was yep. a children's book and a yep. movie. And, yep. you know, in the development of that, and I, and I have to say, my wife is the producer. She got the the rights to the book. She put together the production team, uh, you awesome. know, and it's the first musical to start, the first play to start a dog. Right. But, you know, our first incarnation, we looked at the illustration on the book cover and we got some sight hounds because I know, you know, uh-huh. write the book. Right. So I tried training sighthounds to be on stage, and that was a failure <laughs> right. because everything distracted them. Yep. <laughs> and uh, so we have those two dogs, you know, still living with us. Um, we went to Irish Wolfhounds. Uh-huh. That was our next set of Wind Dixies. Okay. Because they're great with kids. Right. And it's supposed to be a big dog. Um, they were great until we got to the theater, and then they went, what do you mean we have to do eight shows a week? We're just going <laughs> to lay down here and do nothing. Yeah. So they became too tired and unfortunately that was 10 years ago and they've passed on now uh-huh. so then i've decided to use doodles um big poodle mixes yep um and currently we have um six of them um yeah, two that have done our out-of-town tryouts um two that are in the wings ready to do a touring company of that show if it's successful and uh two young ones who are like going to be the next generation so um, you know, again, we usually have four to six of any character type to, um, you know, to do the show, right. to do a show. And only, only when they decide to retire, um, or, or go over the rainbow bridge, do we replace them? Okay. And then, um, it, do you have, are there dogs that will do, do you have dogs that will do multiple or different shows or is it more very specific? Well, if you can get a dog to listen in front of a live audience eight times a week, bringing them on a movie or TV set and having them do a bit are is really easy. You know, so um, all our dogs work at other things, like our dog Bodie, who plays Win dixie uh-huh. starred in Peter Pan Live on NBC. He played Nana, and he's a character on Sesame Street. Okay. You know, yeah. uh, one of our Totos is on a hit series called Mr. Robot. You know, so they can do television gigs. Okay. That's easy. Okay. Um, but, you know, as an agent or a trainer, I can't have every breed that some TV or film producer may, may want. And so we represent other trainers as well who I've checked out and I know they train humanely. And, you know, so sure. that we have a golden retriever or we have, you know, a dachshund. We have, you know, yeah. breeds that are used a lot in advertising and film. Right. Right. Okay. And how um, how do people find you? Um, our website, okay. theatricalanimals.com. Great. 
If you could change one thing that you don't like about your job, like what is that thing you don't like and how would you change it? The one thing I would change is um, having law enforcement representatives on set to assist animal trainers in preventing cruelty. Currently in this country, there are no laws protecting animals in entertainment. Uh -huh. um, there are vague anti-cruelty laws, um, you know, that we know that even dog abusers are hard to prosecute. Right. Um, but, uh, you know, I find it even worse uh, because on a, on a film or entertainment set, trainers are there exploiting their animals for money. So, you know, when I hear stories of abuse, um, it just makes my blood boil, you know, because they're really taking advantage of these wonderful creatures. So I, I wish there were just law enforcement on every on every set, you know, to help us say, you know, because oftentimes, too, I'm, I can't tell you how many jobs I've walked off of because what they wanted me to do, I felt was inhumane. So I'm known in the business as, you know, a real difficult trainer to work with. Why? Because I set standards for my animals that I won't back down on, you know. So that would be the one thing I would change. Um, you know, I've been an advocate and I've I've had to fight to to protect my animals, and it's it's had a debt, you know, it's had a cost on us. Um, but I sleep, my wife and I sleep very well at night, knowing our consciences are clear. Yeah, yeah, I think that um, it, that you know, it says a lot about. Um, who you are and, and really what what people can expect when they when they hire you um, and I think that that's definitely a reputation to to carry um, even though it can and be I, challenging and I I encourage uh, people who pay money to see a movie or go to a theater if you see an animal in distress write the producer write somebody go online and say something yeah you know, um, that way, you know, we can bring more light to this particular subject. Right, um, right. You know, because if, if you upset the audience and ticket buyers stop coming, that makes a statement. Sure. So. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. What um, what are some things that that you would like the general public? Um, you know, we've touched on on a few, but. What would you, you know, would you like the general public to know about um, acting, actors, actresses, animals um, that that maybe we don't know? Hmm. <clears throat> you know, again, it's it's hard for me as a trainer to watch a lot of work with animals in it because if I look at a, a piece of film and I see an animal panting, yeah. I'm, I'm immediately like, oh, my God, that dog's stressed. I mean, it's, you know, <laughs> yeah. and, and those of us who know dogs and know that their tongue is swelled, that they're, they're working too hard or they're stressed, yeah. you know. Yep. Um, and, um, you know, so it's, it's like looking for those little things that, again, may, may trigger um, uh, an audience member to go, hey, I'm going to write a letter about that. That dog did not look happy. Mm -hmm. um, that's one thing. Um, you know, everybody will come and meet Sandy or they'll meet Toto and, you know, say, oh, my God, you're such a good trainer. And the, the bottom line is that that was a great dog in a shelter before I met him. Anybody could have adopted any one of my dogs the day before I did and right. had these great creatures in their lives. You know, so, you know, I want them to think about, you know, adoption. Um, yes, there are dogs that have issues. And if you're not qualified to adopt, handle those issues don't adopt a dog who has issues but there are many many animals cats and dogs who don't have issues that are just ended up there through no fault of their own so you know really think about adopting before you shop and uh uh you know and then there are the there are the actors and actresses who for the majority are are kind and loving people you know and i get to surround myself with people who love animals, you know, and the actors and actresses that I've worked with over the years who are, are kind to animals have become good friends because we share a common humanity. Sure. You know, um, there are a lot of celebrities who, who support a lot of causes, but the ones who also support animal causes, you know, their hearts are just a little bigger. Yeah. So, yep. 
Yeah, for sure. Um, tell us a little bit about um, one of your one of your favorite uh, shows that you've done. Hmm. <laughs> <clears throat> well, Annie obviously changed my life. Uh -huh. um, because of Annie, I've written three books. I've been to the White House on six different occasions. Um, I won a Tony Award, um, which is the the Broadway version of the Oscars. Uh -huh. yeah, I'm the only animal trainer to have won that, a Tony Honor for my work with animals. Um, so that always has a, a great feeling in my heart. Sure. Um, when I do the Wizard of Oz, you know, being a gentleman of a certain age, and I remember grow up watching the Wizard of Oz every year, and, you know, to bring that show to life with Toto uh -huh. um, is so wonderful because, you know, when you think about it, you know, every character in the Wizard of Oz, Dorothy, the Tin Man, Lion, Scarecrow, all take a journey to better themselves. Right. Except for Toto. Right. <laughs> Toto is, Toto's great when we meet him, and he's great all through the story. He's yeah. the only fully actualized character throughout the whole play. Right. You know, so it, I love doing that show. Um, it, it really warms my heart. We do another musical called Legally Blonde uh -huh. based on the film. And, and that's such a fun, lively show with young people and dancing. You know, that one's fun to do. You know, because the music's, you know, sort of pop and you just stand backstage and, and rock and yell, oh, my God, a lot. Um, and uh, so, you know, there are all these I have all these wonderful favorites. And obviously our latest project because of Winn-Dixie, you know, when I when I say to people when I started 40 years ago, Sandy had 13 cues in the original production of Annie. Um, this latest show, uh, our, our dog Winn-Dixie has 109 and it takes me and two other trainers and an actor on stage to make that happen. So, you know, I believe, you know, when it gets to Broadway, we're going to really show how the human animal bond in a way that's never been done. I mean, it's been done in films, but it's never been done on stage. So we're, I'm, I'm really looking forward to that as well. That's, that's got all my heart and soul right now. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us. We're so happy to meet you and learn that you're an advocate for animals and for having a connection with your dog and that you're out in the world making, having all these great experiences, um, having the dogs perform for theater and that they can have, have a job and be happy and have a, a good life with you. We really, really enjoyed talking with you today. Oh, no. Well, again, it's like, I'd much rather talk to people who love animals than, you know, the guy down at the grocery store who's, you know, grumpy. Um, but what's interesting, and, and did you guys see my our, our reality show from Wags to Riches? No, I did okay. not. Uh, three years ago, Discovery came to us and said, we want to do a reality show about you and your family. I was like, great. Um, so they, and they had this new family channel they wanted, you know, for kids. So we were the first live show they produced because they felt we were role models. Um, and I kept saying, well, I just, we just live our lives, you know. Um, but what was great, and I was very proud about that, unfortunately, the, the channel went belly up, so we only did one season. Uh -huh. But, um, you know, what was great was that I invited cameras into our house. And, you know, it's outside of it being dumbed down a little bit for children, you, we had cameras running and microphones running. And, you know, I say to people, when you have nothing to hide, you can put it on television. People may not want to look at it, but, <laughs> right, yeah. but, but when you think about other animal trainers, how you rarely get a glimpse into their training facilities or the care of their animals or, you know, um, we were really proud of the fact that we can, that we had a network who thought we were responsible and role models and, and, you know, put us on television. So if you guys are interested, um, if you have Amazon prime or uh -huh. iTunes, yeah. you could watch it now for free. It's called from wags to riches with Bill Berlini. And you, you'll actually see our house, our farm. And, you know, I chose to open the series with me waking up as a real dad, being totally sleep deprived and, you know, needing coffee. So you get to see, you know, 
a lot of the reality and chaos that goes on, but a lot of the love and care that we do. So sure. we will you, definitely put that on our social media and put that up there because I'm sure, um, you know, everybody loves to see the inside of, of us as well. And they love to, they love to see who we are and, and we're, we are, uh, right. we are open, you know, we, People right. are always welcome in and, and a part of what we do as well, and, and they love that, and you yep. don't get to see that very often. So we'll definitely put that up there um, yep. when, we, uh, may, when we have this podcast go live. We will, we'll put that up there because that's, that's awesome. Yeah, or show some clips or something. Yeah, but again, sure. you know, again, if you've got nothing to hide, yep. then you, know, you put it out there. So that's, that's where people, again – when you're hiring trainers and all that sort of stuff, make sure you do your, your yeah. research and ask the questions, get the references. Um, so, well, and thank you guys for, you know, reaching out. I'm, welcome, I'm sort of a, a unique commodity, but um, I'm always glad to share with other animal lovers. Thank you. Very much. Awesome. Thank you so much. Okay. And I hope your other trainers. Okay. You said you're st- uh, stuck in snow. Yeah, yeah, we're, we're having snow. snow today. <laughs> Jeez. Jeez, I'm so glad I live on the East Coast. <laughs> All right. Yeah, I have All right. Hours, so we'll see. <laughs> Thanks, Bill. Thank you. You're welcome. Take care. Bye. Bye.